for peace and harmony in the country. Uh, we do have people, we do have people in parliament and we do have the judiciary to do all that. We certainly do not go around instigating riots or stoking communal uh, disharmony. That's not our job. Our job is to tell stories and uh, to tell the truth as it is. And let me tell you a few things about what I feel is going on about this whole um, storytelling. And uh, here I think um, it doesn't really matter what form it takes. Uh, it could be print, it could be digital, it could be television. Uh, we've been told three is company. Uh, well, it's what is it? Two is company, three is a crowd, right? I think in India, three is company, actually. Because you see, all three forms are doing quite well. Um, I don't think anywhere in the world uh, do you see the print media actually growing. And in India, um, what is called, what is routinely called regional language uh, press is actually doing extremely well. Um, it's English language newspapers, which are perhaps not doing as well as they were. Um, there are figures to suggest that uh, English language newspapers are down to 12% of uh, circulation and Hindi newspapers have gone up to 38%. But the whole market is growing. It's growing at something like 10 to uh, 8 to 10% a year, which suggests uh, one or two or three things. One, of course, the fact is that, uh, as we all know, literacy can only go up in India. Um, and thankfully, uh, the first thing that people... Uh, want to do is to grab the newspaper and read it and show that, you know, show their literacy levels. That's great. Uh, second, uh, newspapers are actually delivered at home in India, unlike mostly in the West where they're available at newsstands. And third, I think we're just a nation that likes to gossip and likes to talk and likes to have a conversation. You know, what in the West is called a water cooler conversation in our country, it's, you know, the looker, the tea, the chai shop, um, forums like this maybe, where people like to talk about the morning's news. I mean, I'll just give you a small example. We all knew uh, or we all know about the judgment yesterday. Fantastic judgment. Uh, I think everyone was very excited uh, that Article 377 was, uh, um, you know, decriminalized. But when you read uh, the... Indian Express headline today, I don't know how many of you read it, but if uh, there are students in the back and you haven't read it, I suggest you do. It says, love at first right. There is such a sense of power and such a sense, yes, it's right there. It's such a fantastic headline and it just sums up the joy and the, you know, the, the sort of uh, happiness over a judgment like that. I think that proves that there is a place for newspapers, there is a place for the front page in our lives, and there is a place for a conversation starter. Uh, I don't think that can be, uh, that will ever go away in whatever language. Uh, I want to come back to uh, the point that I was trying to make about journalists essentially being storytellers, really. What's our job? Um, uh, it is to tell the truth as we see it, to tell the truth from as many lang as many angles as possible. Uh, if there is a victim, there is a perpetrator. If there is a perpetrator, there is a victim. We always try and get at least two sides of the story. Sometimes there are more than two sides. But it's our job to look at those, to examine those, to distill them and to present them to you. That's why I think whatever the format, I don't think good journalists will ever go away. Because we always need to tell stories. Uh, no society can grow or survive without our collective myths, without our collective stories. I mean, what are, what are the epics uh, that we have grown up on? They're actually, you know, possibly the great journalists of those times, you know, Valmiki and Vyas were perhaps the first journalists, the first recorders that we knew of. People who told the stories of their times. And I think, um, while I'm not exactly Valmiki and Vyas, but I think we also are people who tell the stories of our times, you know, who tell the facts, who tell um, people what's going on. And uh, that's where I think it is our duty to be transparent, it's our duty to be fair, it's our duty to be balanced. Um, and um, 
it's our duty to be interesting. I think the worst thing a journalist or a storyteller can do is to be boring. And I am now getting very afraid because I do not see a single person in the audience who is interested in what I'm saying. So either please raise your hands and say you're very bored and don't want to listen to me anymore. <laughs> or, <laughs> or, you know, uh, I'm very happy to stop. So I hope you're interested in what I'm saying because really for a journalist, that's the ultimate death, you know. You have an audience or a reader who just turns the page and doesn't bother to read the, your entire story or who just switches the channel or uh, if it's uh, your phone just flips uh, the story and goes scrolls down to the next one. Anyway, the, uh, there are two or three things that uh, I thought that um, I'd also tell you, which I feel um, a lot of thinkers have done a lot of work on this. I'm hardly uh, uh, very original in this. But I think uh, the thinker that we all refer to these days is Yuval Noah Harari. And I don't know if you've read his new book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. If you haven't, please do. Of course, you have to read Homo, uh, what, Deus, Homo Deus and Sapiens before that, because that's how his mind works. It works in progression. Uh, but one of the, uh, there are two very interesting things he said uh, about data and information and storytelling in that. And um, one of that is that um, in the new world, uh, data is the new power. Uh, and uh, you had a situation where earlier politics was all about control of land. You still have that in India, of course, because in India we believe in everything at the same time. We're a hybrid economy, hybrid society. We have 12 kinds of transport on the road. We believe in everything should be allowed to live and let live. So uh, I think power, as he says, uh, used to be all about control over land. Uh, and then in the industrial age, in the machine age, power politics became about control over machines. Politics now, he says, is about control over data, control over information. And I think that's very interesting because uh, whoever controls data, whoever spins that information better, is the one who's going to control society, going to control minds. And you see that um, all the time. Whether it's GDP figures or whether it's the Raphael uh, figures, you know, whoever can spin that better, or the 1 lakh crore, 70,000 uh, supposed loss that we had in the 2G scam, anyone who can spin data better is really the one who uh, can control power. And I think that's very significant. The second thing that he, did, uh, that he said is that actually you had a situation earlier where censorship was all about controlling the flow of information and making sure that people didn't get to read or didn't get to hear or didn't get to see the entire truth. And you had that in uh, the emergency in 75. Um, what he says now is that censorship has actually become about letting information flourish. And what happens in that society is that you have so much information. You have disinformation, which is usually government propaganda, but you can have all sorts of propaganda. You have useless information, which is all about what did Virat Kohli eat today? What did, uh, where will they pick up Adagon and uh, uh, Ranveer Singh, Ranveer Singh, right? Where will they get married? It's all useless information. It clutters our mind and, you know, it just uh, sort of, uh, you know, bogs us down in absolutely pointless information. Very interesting, but all pointless, you know. So our minds have become absolute, uh, you know, um, sort of, uh, um, what do you say, absorbers of trivia. Uh, and uh, then there is absolutely uh, confusing information. And here is where you get things like fake news, which I'll come to a little later. I've been asked to very specifically speak about fake news. Both of us have been asked. So, um, so, and you have confusing information. So what happens is in this deluge of information, misinformation, disinformation, useless information, what, you actually cannot make up your mind. So in a way, too much information can also be a form of censorship because you have no discrimination. You don't know what is important. You don't know what is, at least in a newspaper, or a magazine, thank you, you know there's a front page, there's a sports page, there's a middle page where the uh, uh, opinion uh, uh, is, where the commentary is. So it gives you a sense of 
what is important. It gives you a sense of hierarchy of news. In this constant flow of information, you don't know. Which is why you need us. You need us and you need future journalists and you need people with certain skills who can tell you, look, this is what is I feel today. This is what is important. I feel tomorrow. This is what will be important. And come to me and I will not give you gyan because nobody wants gyan anymore. Nobody wants the person who's sitting on the pulpit like me and declaiming. Uh, uh, there are a few journalists on television who love to do that. They love the sound of their own voices and they love monologues and they love shouting down anyone else who has an opposing opinion. But that's not really good journalism. That's great entertainment. That's a great circus show that you see every night at 9 p.m. I'm not sure that that's great journalism. Great journalism is when someone tells you, look, this is what I feel is right. This is what another person feels is right. And here are the two sides of the story. Make up your own minds, right? But here are the full facts, as, as much as we know them. And I think that's what is important. That's why I think uh, journalism survives. That's why I think in America, if Trump hasn't made America great again, he certainly made journalism great again. Uh, and... Mm, you find uh, journalists are huge stars now. I don't know if you've all watched something called The Fourth Estate. It's a lovely four-part uh, documentary. It's very simple. It just chronicles a year in the life of New York Times. And it just chronicles the way the New York Times, which, as we know, uh, Trump says hates him. And they say, no, no, they don't hate him. They just want to put him in his place. And they just want to show that you know, show him the mirror. So it just chronicles a year in the life of the New York Times and it is fantastic. It just made a huge start of a very regular journalist, you know, could be you, me, anyone, Maggie Haberman. Fantastic work that, you know, I mean, she could be a star. She is the star of this uh, uh, series. <clears throat> it's also made, uh, uh, you know, journalism movie school again. I think all of you may have watched Spotlight, you may have watched The Post. If you haven't, please go and watch them again. Uh, they again tell you what journalism is, what journalism can be. And it's very interesting, uh, two, uh, two NYT reporters, again, uh, the two people who uh, broke the Harvey Weinstein story, they're going to be the subject of uh, a new movie. That's Jodie Captor and Megan Tumori. So um, the possibility that journalists could also end up as film stars is interesting, I think. Maybe not us, but maybe the next generation. What else? Um, yeah, and I think here is where I want to bring in fake news. Uh, why are we so concerned about it? Why are we uh, getting so... Um, why has it become such an issue? Um, one, I think we are sort of looking at it from the wrong angle. We uh, tend to blame, and this is an old problem in India, uh, maybe with, yeah, e everywhere else in the world as well. We tend to blame the messenger for the message. Um, fake news is not a problem of WhatsApp. WhatsApp exacerbates it. Or uh, digital media, social media. <coughs> See, I told you, journalists are not used to talking so much. We're used to listening. Thanks. <laughs> uh, you know, so what happens with fake news is that uh, you you tend to uh, shoot the messenger. Okay, WhatsApp is to be blamed, or Facebook is to be blamed, or Twitter is to be blamed. No, fake news is just a manifestation of what already exists in society. Nobody tells the villagers in Dhule to lynch the stranger who comes to their village, and they assume that he's a child lifter. Nobody tells people in Tripura to do the same. Nobody tells people in Muzaffarnagar <coughs> to have riots. It happens because already society is deeply polarized, already society is deeply divided along various lines. You have common lines, caste lines, gender. We all know the divisions. And fake news tends to exacerbate that. Fake news is a manifestation. You want to believe 
then the other, the other is in capital T, capital O, is someone that you cannot trust, someone who is suspicious, someone who, um, you know, is uh, is uh, out to do mischief. And that's when I think uh, the danger, fake news becomes dangerous. And that's when I think the point is not to tell WhatsApp to control it. The point is to tell society to not believe these things, which is, of course, a far more difficult thing. <clears throat> I think just the last point, um, and I think I made this before, but I'd just like to reiterate it. Uh, I think in India, we have had a situation where we've had the hybrid economy. We've had a hybrid society. We've had modernity and tradition surviving together. We've had um, uh, socialism and capitalism surviving together. We've had all sorts of isms living quite peacefully pretty much until now. So uh, I see no reason why three cannot be company. I see no reason why print, div uh, television, digital cannot coexist. As I said at the very beginning, our job really is to tell stories. How we tell the stories is really uh, what makes us great. And how well we do it, how well our future generations tell our stories, what kind of community will be created by these story, stories that we tell each other. I think that is what is important. And that's why I think journalism is very important. And um, while we individually may not be important, the craft of journalism and the skill that you bring to it will continue to be important. Thank you.